<clears throat> After moving on from a coaster brake bike some many decades ago, I decided to check it out again. Reinvent it. No, re uh, re examine, rediscover. I decided to rediscover the coaster brake. And what I discovered was very good, good news. It's very efficient, it's very simple, and we're going to take an in depth look at the actual engineering behind the uh, coaster brake. Uh, existing videos show, you know, how to take them apart, how to grease them, how to put them together. But we're going to examine each part as to the function and engineering behind it. This one I removed from an old uh, beach cruiser. It's still got some blue paint on it. We won't worry about that. I've removed all the grease and lightly oiled the interior for convenience. So let's take each thing apart and review the function of each part and why it's so great. So we'll just take off the axle nut. And here's a snap ring that holds the cog. I took it off so that we don't, don't fuss around prying it out. Here's the cog. Standard cog. Sturmy Archer makes them. Here's the lock nut for the right side cone which is the adjustable cone it adjusts everything all the bearings at once and uh, the left side is not adjustable so here's the cone here's the right side cone we'll spin that out this is the same cone design that you'll find in the modern modern wheel hub nothing particularly great about that this is just a metal shield to go over the bearing well the driver actually just a metal shield not much function Okay, here is one of the key parts of the coaster hub. Well, first the bearing, regular caged ball bearing. And its shield. This is one of the key parts. This is called the driver. Now, in any mechanism, a driver is that item which imparts motion to the mechanism. This takes the motion of the cog, which turns when you crank the pedals, and operates the coaster brake hub itself. This is the driver, very coarse thread, a multi-start thread. A small rotation of the driver creates pretty fast linear motion. Here's a second bearing, second of three bearings. Now, now we're ready to pull off the hub and see what's on the other side of the hub. Here's the bear hub, stripped down to just a one piece. Now here's the second key part. This is called a clutch. The driver shuttles the clutch back and forth. When you pedal forward, the clutch, the driver pulls the clutch into engagement with the hub. A little knurling here to get a good grip. This actually drives the hub drives the wheel. Notice that that's all we have. A little knurled beveled spot on the clutch. There are no pawls, no ratchets, no dogs, no gear teeth. 
Very simple. 100% efficiency. 100% efficient. You get out what you put in, because there's no relative motion once the clutch is engaged with the hub. Now, this is a dual purpose piece. When you stop pedaling, this stops, well this continues to turn, but it, uh, the hub continues to turn, the clutch does not, it freewheels. When you pedal backwards, the driver reverses the direction of the clutch, pushes it to the left. What happens when you push the clutch to the left? You get to engage the brake shoes. The taper, here's another tapered part of the clutch, spreads the brake shoes. These are metal brake shoes. They actually last a long time. I've never seen any worn out, but they do wear out and you can replace them very easily. So this, the clutch becomes a brake shoe carrier, brake shoe spreader. The brake shoes bear against the hub, stopping the wheel. Continuing on, the left side bearing and the left side cone. Now you can see that the cone is not adjustable, it's permanently locked with this locking nut here. And you can see that the braking force, the braking torque is transmitted to the cone and from the cone to the axle to stop the bicycle. Now even though the cone, the left side cone is locked down, it tends to loosen because the, bra the braking torque is pretty high. So to keep it from loosening, we have the torque arm which engages with the cone which we'll see as soon as we take off is the left axle nut and now I'm spinning off the left cone lock nut and a washer to this cupped washer slightly cupped to distribute the stress from the lock nut the brake arm kind of beat up had lots of miles on it and a shield bearing shield and here is the all-important left side cone which right here these notches protrusions absorb the braking torque and this square part engages with the torque arm to keep the cone from moving. So that's it. That's it. We're not, I'm not going to put it together. As, as the manuals tend to say, the assembly is the reverse of the disassembly. So going, at, go, going over it again, the cog turns the driver, the driver shuttles the clutch back and forth. When it pulls the clutch to the right, it engages the hub and drives the wheel. When it pushes to the left, it spreads the brake shoes and stops the bike. Now this spring here is your, we call it a clutch return spring. So when you stop braking, it pops to the right, the brake shoes drop, and they no longer drag on the hub. We're done. Now, this is all, this all happens without the noise of Paul's ratchets, gear teeth, 
etc. It's very, very quiet. And it's quick acting due to the pitch on the driver. It, the driving torque is taken up very rapidly. The brakes are applied very rapidly with minimal movement of the pedals and absolutely no noise. Very efficient. And another great thing is that we've got a total of three bearings. There's the right side bearing, the left side bearing, and a center bearing. So there's a lot of support for the axle. Unlike more modern free hubs or free wheels or internal geared hubs, which only have two bearings, and sometimes you can bend or break an axle with a coaster, you have three. So that's it. This is why I like the uh, design of the coaster brake and why I've gone back to trying a coaster brake bike.